Hello, Grandpa here, taking a little break from gar gardening <clears throat> to go on with the story of Toothiana, Queen of the Tooth Fairy Armies. Oh, yes, Toothiana. Well, I thought I'd take a little break and <clears throat> relax with some story here. Chapter five. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> it was a little cold out there. An amazing journey to the top of the world. The next morning, the whole village gathered at the entrance of Bunny Mun's latest digging extravaganza, a tunnel that would take them to the Lunar Lamadary. With great fanfare, Bunny Mun swung open the tunnel's egg shaped door and stepped into the first car of the extraordinary locomotive that would speed them on their way. Trains were still not yet invented. Still not yet invented. Bunny Mung would secretly help the credited inventors some decades later. So that would put this story somewhere in the 1800s, huh? So the machine and its technology were still a source of considerable amazement for the people of Santop Quasin. Like the tunnel he had created, Bunny Mun's railway train was also egg-shaped. Well, maybe earlier than that, I'm not exactly sure about the provenance of railway in Europe. Well, I'm only thinking about the United States. Bunny Mun's railway train was also egg-shaped, as was every knob, door, window, and light fixture. It was easy to tell he was quite proud of his creation. Ombrick, North, Catherine, and Kailash, along with North's elfin comrades, the children, and their parents scrambled on board. Bunny Mun was twisting and turning the myriad of egg-shaped controls. The spirit of the forest waved her shimmering veils at them as Bunny Mun started the engine. Aren't you coming? Catherine called out, hanging from a window. The spirit of the forest shook her head, the jewels in her hair casting a glistening rainbow-like glow around her. I am a creature of the forest, and in the forest I will stay. Petrov, Bear, the egg bots, Jeannie, and I will watch over the village while you are away. The gardens of flowers around her seemed to be nodding in agreement as the villagers waved by with calls of see you soon and we'll miss you. As soon as the train began to move, Sasha turned to Catherine excitedly. Tell us again about the Lunar Lamas, she said, and the Yetis, her brother Petter added. A train. But Catherine was distracted. Nightlight had gotten on board. In fact, she hadn't seen him since yesterday afternoon. She looked out the window as the train began to descend into the tunnel. Where is he? Then, as the last car heaved downward, she glimpsed him, swooping into a window at the back of the train. She felt instantly better. Please, will you tell us of the Yetis, the smallest William begged, pulling on Catherine's shirt sleeve. She turned to him with a smile now that she knew Nightlight was at least on board. She searched through the pages of Mr. Querty until she came to the drawing she had made of the Grand High Lama. His round face seemed to beam with them. The Lamas, remember, are holy men, Catherine told them, even older than Ombrick. They've devoted their whole lives to studying the man in the moon. They know all about nightlight and how he used to protect the little man in the moon in the golden age before Pitch. She cut herself off. She did not want to think about Pitch right now. The llamas live in a palace, Sasha prompted. Well, not a palace really, but a fantastic place called the Lamadary. Catherine turned the page, revealing the llama's home, glowing as if with moonlight. There's nowhere else on earth closer to the moon than the lunar lamadary. Now, tell us about the Yetis, Petter begged. 
<clears throat> there is the high lama. The yetis, oh, they are magnificent creatures, Catherine said, but her voice began to trail off. They helped us defeat pitch. She didn't want to go into it, huh? There's a Yeti. <laughs> I can't wait to see it all with my own eyes, Sasha said dreamily, especially the man in the moon. And mountains so high, we'll be above the clouds, Fog added. The children began chattering among themselves about the adventures to come, not noticing that Catherine had grown quiet. She rose from her seat. She felt uneasy again, and the children's company didn't suit her right now. She didn't really know where she wanted to be, with the children, or with Nor, the other grown-ups. Even Kailash didn't comfort her. She was betwixt and between. She started toward the back of the train. The only company she desired right now was nightlights. Chapter six, the chicken or the egg, a puzzle. While the children were anticipating their first trip to the Himalayas, Ombrick and Bunny Mun were in a deep debate about which came first, the chicken or the egg. Ombrick believed it was the chicken. Bunny Mun, not surprisingly, believed it was the egg. But the puka had to admit that he could not answer the question definitively. Eggs are the most perfect shape in the universe, he argued. It's logical that the egg would come first and the chicken would follow. But where did the first egg come from if the chicken did not exist? Holmberg asked. Where did the chicken come from? Bunny Mun pointed out. If not from the egg. Privately, each one believed he had won the argument. But publicly, the wizard deferred to the puka. Bunny Mun was the only creature alive who was both older and wiser than Ombrick. In fact, when Ombrick had been a young boy in Atlantis, and had first experimented with his magic, it had been Bunny Mund who had saved him from a most tragic end. Ombrick had learned so much since he'd become reacquainted with the Puka. He felt almost like a student again, but perhaps he thought he had something to teach, E. asked her. Have you ever met the Lunar Lamas? Ombrick asked, eager to fill him in on their strange ways. Yes and no. Bunny Mun replied mysteriously. It was rather difficult getting that mountain in place before their ship crashed to earth back. Oh, before the beginning of your recorded time. So we have what you might call a history, but does anyone really know anyone? I mean to say, I mean to say I've met them, <laughs> I've talked to them, I've read their minds, and they've read mine. But do I know what they'll say or do next at any given moment, or what underwear they wear on Tuesdays, and why do I, do I really know, do I? Omrig blinked and tried to take in all that information. It was an answer of sorts. Indeed, he said at last, hmm, yes, well, hmm, well, all right. That must be how they knew to point us in your direction when we sought the relic. He glanced up at the sumptuously bejeweled egg that adorned the top of Bunny Mun's staff and raised an eyebrow. They would tell us only that I was mysterious and preferred to remain unknown, Bunny Mun finished for him, steering the train around a graceful oval curve. True, absolutely true, etched in stone, so to speak, at least until I made the curiously rewarding acquaintance of you and your fellows most unexpected 
utterly surprising. And as you say, a hoot. Bunnyman had developed a genuine pleasure in using the new expressions he heard in the company of what he called earthlings. Ombrick smiled at the fellow. I like you too, Bunnyman. The rabbit's ears twitched. I can't twitch my ears. Such obvious statements of earthling sentiments never failed to baffle him. Yet, while Lapuka would never admit it, Ombrick could tell that he was beginning to actually enjoy the company of humans, in small doses anyway. Small doses. As they neared the Himalayas, Catherine combed through the car, through car after car, chattering villagers and elves looking for nightlight. North's elves were busily working on what looked like a drawing or plans for something. They cheerfully covered their pages from her view. She decided not to pry, for she rather liked these funny little men. But more to the point, she was on a mission to find nightlight. Then, as it always happened, she knew that it was time for her to meet with the other guardians, and she could sense that nightlight was there with them. She followed this feeling as it led her to the train's front car, or as Bunnymund referred to it, the ego motive. They were all there, north in the back by the door, Ombrick and Bunnymund, tinkering excitedly with the controls, and out the front window she could see nightlight sitting face forward in front of the engine smokestack. He did not turn around, though. She knew, feel her presence. Did not turn around. Didn't turn around. Though she knew he could feel her presence. His hair was blowing wildly as the train blasted ahead. The sound of the train was loud, but it was pleasing, like 10,000 whisks scrambling countless eggs. Perhaps nightlight misses all the excitement of battle, Captain thought, watching him lean forward into the air rushing past. She wondered if North did as well. He was humming to himself, a faraway look on his face. Mm -hmm. Something was now different about the young wizard. He was still always ready to leap into action, still loved conjuring up new toys for the children. Just that morning, he brought the youngest William a funny sort of toy, a round, biscuit-shaped piece of wood with a string attached on its, to its middle. When jerked, it would go up and down almost magically. North called it a yo-yo-ho. And he still continued to tease Bunny Mun, whom he insisted on calling Bunny Man, no matter how many times the Pooka corrected him. Nevertheless, Catherine sensed the change, a change she couldn't quite put her finger on. In those moments when he thought no one was looking, North had become quieter, more contemplative. And yet he didn't seem sad or melancholy or lonely like Nightingale did. His face was alive with excitement. What is he up to, she wondered, hoping that when he was ready, he would tell her about it. If only she could be sure the nightlight would be so forthcoming. All this change is so unsettling. Peace is harder than I thought it would be. North, sensing her presence, grinned and brushed a lock of hair from her forehead. Ready to see the man in the moon again? Catherine put on an impish smile and nodded yes. She could feel the train beginning to climb upward. The engine strained to pull the egg-shaped cars and their festive cargo up toward the Himalayan mountain peak. They were nearly there. Chapter 7 In which the man in the moon greets the guardians with a fair amount of fanfare. Well, well, well. The guardians exchanged looks full of anticipation. 
Even Bunny Mun, who considered anything non-chocolate or egg-related to be of little importance, looked forward to sharing the news that they believed Hitch had been vanquished. For the last few minutes of the journey, the train was traveling completely vertical. Catherine had to hang on to North or she'd slide out the door. Then the first car popped out of the tunnel into the clear, perfect light of the highest place on Earth. A new egg-shaped egomotive station was in place, and the train came to rest at the outskirts of the lunar lamedary. The holy men now waited on the platform in their silver slippers and billowing silk-spun robes. They bowed deeply at the sight of Nightlight, who hopped lightly off the engine. Having once been the protector of the man in the moon, Nightlight always received their greatest reverence. Their moon-like faces, normally inscrutable, resonated joy at his life. And this seemed to brighten Nightlight's mood as well. But he was still distant from Catherine. Distant with Catherine. Old William and his sons, along with all the other parents and children, gaped in wonder at the sight of the Lama's headquarters and the cool, serene, creamy glow of its moonstone and opal mosaics. Sasha nearly tumbled out of the train's window her effort to see the Lamadary's famous tower, which was also an airship. Even Mr. Quirty, his pages fluttering, hurried toward the train's doors to get a closer look. Gongs rang out. Bells, hundreds of them, chimed in the wind. Yalo, the leader of the Yetis, stood with the snow geese at the edge of the platform and blew a silver horn forged from ancient meteors. As the snow geese honked a warm hello, the sight of Kailash and Catherine. As the welcoming reverberations quieted, Ombrick stepped onto the platform. Greetings, my good friends, he addressed the gathering. We've come to speak to the man in the moon and to report what we think is historic news. The old man was clearly eager to see the man in the moon and share their findings. But there were the curiously slow habits of the llamas to consider. They never did anything quickly and were usually very, very, very talkative. And yet, surprisingly, it seemed that the llamas were just as eager to proceed. It was highly unusual for them to rush for any reason. But today, they whisked everyone off the train and directly toward the llamadary's courtyard. The yetis lined the outer edges of the courtyard as the llamas led everyone else to the huge gong at its very center. The children could barely contain their excitement. The man in the moon was about to be summoned. The Grand High Lama glided forward. He smiled serenely then. Oh, he smiled serenely. Then, with almost shocking suddenness, he struck the great gong with his gilded scepter. The sound was sweet and strong. It grew and echoed throughout the temple, then throughout the mountains around them until it sounded as though the whole earth was humming a gentle, Hello to the head. The gong itself began to shimmer, shifting from a solid metal to a clear glass-like substance. And as the children pointed in astonishment, the moon began to appear in the milky light at the gong's center, swelling in size until a face emerged from the quaters, the kindest, kindest, gentlest face anyone could imagine. The kindest, gentlest face anyone could imagine. The llamas bowed 
as did the five guardians and everyone else in the courtyard. As they stood up, night light and the friendly moonbeam that lived in the dim diamond tip of his staff blinked a greeting. North raised his sword and saluted, and noticed that he began to glow. So did the egg on the top of Bunny Moon's staff. Catherine held her dagger aloft excitedly as she had when she had bowed to battle pitch so many months ago, when Omrick simply placed the palms of his hands together and lowered his head even farther in greeting. Tsar Lunar, he said, in a reverent tone, we've scoured the earth for pitch and found no trace of him. Can you tell us, has he truly been defeated? The image on the gong flickered and waned like moonlight on a cloudy night. The man in the moon's voice was so deep it almost seemed like a heartbeat. My valiant friends, he said, each night I send thousands of moonbeams down to earth, and each night they return clear and unvarnished by pitch's dark ways. As he spoke, a wide smile spread across his face. Cheers rung out throughout the lamentary. It appears the world is on the cusp of a new golden age, he continued. A golden age on earth. And it is you, my guardians, who must guide its creation. It is a task of great and daring imagination and thoughtful dreaming. Everyone's eyes turned to Ombrick, Catherine, Bunny Mun, North, and Nightlight. One old, one young, one from another world, one who overcame a most disreputable beginning, and one a spirit of light. Such a group could bring about a golden age, but who would lead this historic endeavor? To everyone's surprise, it was North who stepped forward. I have a plan, he said. He sheathed his sword and raised his other hand, opening his palm to reveal a small paper box covered with minute drawings and plans. Catherine recognized it as what the elves were working on. This was a gift, one that I must pass on, North began, stealing a glance at Catherine and then turning back to the man in the moon. A dream for the new golden age. Chapter eight, the future unfolds. With that, North closed his eyes for a moment, recalling Ombrick's first lesson. The power of magic is believing. Ombrick's first lesson. The power of magic lies in believing. He began to chant, I believe, I believe. Ombrick, Catherine, even Bunnyman joined him, quickly followed by the entire courtyard, and the box in North's hand unfolded into a vast origami wonder. A magical city seemed to grow out of North's palm. Ombrick's eyebrows raised. North was becoming something more powerful than a warrior or a wizard. Ombrick could sense it. North tipped his head toward Catherine, whose eyes were shining. This was the dream she had given him, when all seemed lost during one of the first great battles with Pitch, a dream in which North was a powerful figure of mirth, mystery, and magic, who lived in a city surrounded by snow. Sound familiar? Catherine nodded back encouragingly, and so North started. I have a plan for building new centers of magic and learning, North explained. One village like Santoff Close is not enough, and to expand it would be to change it. What we need instead are more places for all those with kind hearts and inquiring minds, all those with 
kind hearts and inquiring minds, inventors, scientists, artists, and visionaries will be welcomed and encouraged, where children will always be safe and protected and grow to become their finest selves. The paper city hovered in the air just above North's palm. There was a great castle-like structure in its center, surrounded by workshops and cottages. A tiny Nicholas St. North could be seen striding through the village center with his elves, Petrov, his horse, by his side. And a herd of mighty reindeer. The yetis were there, too. North bowed his head and waited for the man in the moon's response. He thought he might feel anxious at this moment. Instead, he felt peaceful, more peaceful than he could ever remember feeling. He had shared the truest dream of his heart. The man in the moon gazed down at North. He didn't need to say anything. His luminous smile said all that needed saying. Didn't need to say anything. His luminous smile said all it needed saying. A Tear of Mystery, Chapter 9. A Tear of Mystery. With all the hurly-burly and hubbub surrounding this new golden age in the city north would build, Catherine found herself lost in the shuffle. The adult guardians were in a frenzy of excitement, talking heatedly among themselves. She didn't mind, really. It made her happy to see North Holmbrick in deep discussions again. It was like old times. And watching Bunny Mund interject ideas was always amusing. He was enthusiastic as long as the plans involved chocolate or eggs. As the discussions went on, she realized they'd made a slight breakthrough. Bunnyman was now willing to broaden his interest, his interest to other types of candies. Anything that is sweet has great philosophical and curative powers and as such, could be key to this new golden age, he pronounced with his usual droll pukery. The villagers of Santoff Plaza were also happily speculating about new innovations and technologies. The children especially were caught up in the commotion. Sasha and the youngest William came up to Catherine. What do you think all this means, Sasha asked. Catherine thought for a moment, then answered, it means There'll be an amazing, there'll be amazing new things to invent and build and see and do. Sasha's and William's eyes grew bright as they tried to imagine what this future would be like. As if reading their minds, Catherine added, everything will be different. Before they could ask her to explain, she caught a glimpse of nightlight up on the highest tower of the lamedary, she hurried after him. All his dodging about had increasingly worried her. She could not feel his friendship. She could feel nothing at all from him. The steps to the bell tower were steeper than she'd expected and proved hard to climb. North's compass, which she hadn't taken off since he'd given it to her all these long, those long months ago, was swinging back and forth thunking against her chest in a most annoying way. But she didn't stop to remove it. She just climbed on. I hope that light hasn't flown off, hasn't flown off, she thought, trying to see around a corner. She neared the top steps. She began climbing much more quietly. Through an arched window, she could see him on the other side, perched on the ledge. His back was to her, but she could see that his head hung low, almost to his knees. The light from the diamond point of his staff was dim. And for the first time in days, she could sense his feelings. His feelings were sad, very sad. First time 
from day she could sense his feelings. His feelings were sad, very sad. She'd never known night light to be sad. She crept closer still until she could see that he was holding something. Carefully, carefully, without making a sound, she balanced herself out onto the ledge right next to him. In his hands, he held something. She leaned forward even closer with a tear, a single tear. Nightlight suddenly realized she was there. He jumped to his feet with an abruptness that startled her. She teetered for a moment, windmilling her arms for balance. In a terrible instant, she fell from the ledge. be continued.